Hello, welcome to another video of General Chemistry 1. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to be continuing our look at thermodynamics and thermochemistry. In particular, we're going to be looking at um, changes of heat in a system, as well as the thermodynamics that occur during a phase change. And that's going to be through calorimetry and, well, looking at heating curves, respectively. So we're going to look at specific heat and the heat capacity of materials. We're going to look at constant volume and constant pressure calorimetry. And lastly, we're going to end off with heating curves and the thermodynamics of a phase change. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is specific heat and heat capacity. These are just um, properties of different materials. The first one we're going to look at is specific heat capacity. So specific heat capacity is just the amount of substance, uh, sorry, amount of heat required to increase one gram of substance by one degree Celsius. So that will just have the units of joules per grams degree of C. And this is an intensive property. Related to that is molar heat capacity. So that's just the same thing, except we're replacing grams with moles. So it's the amount of heat required to heat up one mole of substance, one degree Celsius, as the units joules per mole degree C. Lastly, we have heat capacity. That's the um, amount of heat required to increase a given quantity of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, one important detail to note is that heat capacity is an extensive property. Specific heat capacity is an intensive property because your heat, capaci heat capacity down here doesn't have any kind of mass units, meaning the heat capacity of a greater amount of substance will be higher than a smaller amount. Whereas for specific heat capacity, the amount is given in the unit. And hence, it's going to be the same. It's just a per gram unit. So it'll scale down depending on well, no, I'm sorry, it won't scale down depending on how much of the substance you have. Okay, it's a, there's a small distinction to keep in mind. So here's a table of some specific heat capacities. You'll see that water actually has a very high heat, specific heat capacity, and that's why it takes a lot of energy to boil water. Um, metals have a r relatively low specific heat capacity. That's why metals get hot so easily. That's why the pan that you're boiling your water in will be hotter than the water itself sometimes. The important distinction to note here with all these specific heat capacities is that a, a lower heat capacity means less energy is required to heat it up. So for example, let's say we had 100 joules of energy. Energy. It's going to, this 100 joules of energy is going to heat up something like aluminum more than it's going to do it for um, water because the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18. So that means that 4.18 joules are required per gram of water. Oh, I should also note this is equal grams, so like 10 grams aluminum, 10 grams of water. Yeah. So for water, it's 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So you need, for every gram, you need 4.18 joules to increase it one degree. For aluminum, you only need 0 0.89 joules per gram degree C. So higher specific heat, I'll just call that C, means more heat required to raise temperature. That's the basic gist of that. OK? So we can also use our specific heats to look at heat change. So the formula for that is just Q equals the mass times specific heat capacity times the change in temperature, where this is a change in temperature, or the number of moles times the molar heat capacity times the change in temperature. Or if there's if you have heat capacity, it's just heat capacity times the um, change in temperature. And we'll see some examples of that as we look into calorimetry. So calorimetry is just simply the measure of heat changes in a reaction system based on temperature changes. There's two kinds we can look at. There's constant pressure calorimetry, which we use to determine the enthalpy of um, reaction changes. And there's constant volume calorimetry, which is used to determine heat of combustion of various substances. Okay? So the first one, constant pressure calorimetry, you've probably, maybe you've done this in high school. 
It's a very simple system. You'll have uh, a most a simple constant kind of pressure calorimeter is just uh, some insulated styrofoam cups. You put your reaction inside the cups, have a thermometer reading the different temperatures. So what will happen here is that your calorimeter starts at an initial temperature and you add another reagent, a reaction occurs. So the enthalpy change of this reaction will determine what kind of temperature change you get. For example, if you have an exothermic reaction, you'll have a temperature increase. If you have an endothermic reaction, you'll have a temperature decrease. And we can quantify this by the fact that delta H equals QP equals MC delta T. Remember that since this is a constant pressure system, we have d the en change in enthalpy is just equal to the heat released. So in that way, we can calculate enthalpy and heat from a uh, constant pressure calorimeter. Okay? And one more thing to note is that we'll, we'll treat the systems we look at as isolated systems, meaning no heat is lost to the outside environment beyond the uh, reaction vessel. So what that means is that all the heat that was um, made from the reaction plus the heat of the water is going to be zero. What that means, what that basically means, is that the temper, the heat gained or lost by the reaction is going to equal the heat gained or lost by the surroundings. In this case, the solvent, the water, the cups, whatever you want to choose. Okay, and so we're going to use that fact to look at a problem. So we have an aluminum pellet of mass 12.1 grams and 81.7 degrees Celsius is added to a styrofoam cup with water at 23.4 degrees C. And we're told the final temperature of that water is 24.9. So what's the mass of the water in the container, assuming an isolated system? Okay, so we're solving for something different here, but it's going to be the same method we used, even if we wanted to quantify the amount of heat transferred. So the first thing we're going to know is that the aluminum pellet starts at 81.7. The water starts at 23.4. And the equilibrium temperature is this 24.9. So the aluminum lost heat, the water gained heat. So we can say that the heat gained by water is going to equal the heat lost by aluminum. We can say that the heat of aluminum is just equal to mc delta t. So that's just going to be the mass is 12.1 grams. Specific heat is 0 0.89. And then the temperature change is going to be that 81.7, which is the, inf no, sorry. It's always final minus initial f for temperature. So that's going to be 24.9 is the final temperature of everything minus 81.7. And so that will get us a value of negative 611.68 joules, like that. Okay, so if we just take the, ab take the absolute value of that, we get that the Q of water is equal to 611.68, and that's positive. So now we can use that with the same equation as before to quantify how much water we had. So we can say that the Q of H2O is equal to its mass times C times delta T. We know everything except mass. So we have 611.68 joules equals M. C is 4.18. And then the temperature change is our final temperature is 24.9 minus 23, oops, 23.4, like so. And so if we solve all that, the mass of water is going to be 97 grams. Okay, so important takeaways from this are that the heat gained by the water was lost by the aluminum because we have an isolated system here, so everything stays within the system. Nothing's lost to the environment. We determined the heat... Um, we determined the heat given to the system by the cooling of aluminum that came out to be this negative 611.68. And then we used that fact as long as this, well as this equation up here in order to determine the mass of water.